Hello, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, very welcome to the new edition of this GeoTop A seminar. It is my pleasure to introduce uh, Antonio Risa. And you can look at your chat. You will find the title, which is Applied Topology from the Classical Point of View and the Way to Ask Questions. So, Antonio, Blue Jeans is yours. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for the organizers for, for having me. Uh, it's great to, to speak on, in this, uh, this seminar. Um, so I'm, my, my talk is titled Applied Topology from the Classical Point of View, and I'll explain a little bit in a second what I mean by that. Um, but uh, first, let me go to, oops, what happened? My keyboard is not responding. Let's see. While your keyboard is not responding, I forgot to say that you are working in Guanajuato in Mexico. Yes, yes. Ah, there in we go. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so in, in applied topology, we have uh, a number of, of unusual questions, uh, at least <clears throat> from for the point of view of an algebraic topologist. And so first of all, let me see. We have this, this issue, especially in topological data analysis, where we have some, some topological space, uh, or we believe we have some topological space, but the, the only thing we have access to are some points from the space. And, and so there's this question that comes up, and it's, it's answered implicitly in, in a lot of what people do, but I want to ask it uh, explicitly, is, is what does it really mean to, uh, to represent a topological, and particularly a compact Hausdorff space, by a finite set. And this is not the only way to do this. You know, notice I said finite set. I didn't tell you what the set was, right? You could, I mean, the question in, in a sense is actually very old. You could have, it could be a finite set of cells or simplices or something. But um, <clears throat> in, in sort of modern applied topology, where we are actually looking at finite sets of uh, of points, and so you throw away most of the, the space and you, you're left with a finite set of points. And so how can this be, be done? And, and the second, which kind of gets to, uh, approaches the way I want to answer this question is, how, how can you compare the, the invariance? Okay, so let me, let me get my figures back. So the normal way we compare invariance of two spaces is by, well, let's say, you know, a triangle and a circle, right, is by having a map in one direction and a map in another direction, or maybe just in one, and then applying some kind of functor, your favorite one, let's say homology, and you get some group, right? So you're you're in groups here and groups here, and the your original maps, right, induced some maps here in your groups. Well, there's a problem with this, at least in this picture, right? So the problem is is fairly obvious. We have a very nice map here. It doesn't tell us very much about the the comparison. Um, you know, just inclusion, right? But the map here is, at least from a topological point of view, uh, constant, right? So if, if you if you want to stay in in topology and insist on staying in topology, uh, <clears throat> you're stuck with constants. And but I'm I'm going to be be sort of insistent that we really we really want this map, and I'm going to be so insistent that. <clears throat> That's going to be so important that I'm going to throw away the idea that we need to stay in topology, and so that's uh, that's really what this whole uh, this whole talk is about. So how how do we do how do we get this map back, and and then you know we have the the rest of our functorial picture, right? And this is the what I mean by the classical point of view. We just want this the simple this kind of simple picture that we used to have by comparing different topological spaces using algebraic means. And I want to put this back in the situation where on one side, you know, we have a, a very strange space. And, um, well, you know, 
nominally trivial, but we have to we have to do something to make it non-trivial. Okay. <clears throat> okay. And the way I'm going to do that, so I said um, we're going to leave topology. So so the things we want though, we want to keep topological spaces. We don't want to throw them away. Um, we want these these point clouds. And what's a point cloud going to be? I, I want I want a little bit more than point clouds. Actually, I want metric spaces. But I'm going to to privilege one scale. So so I want to know everything about my metric space. Um, given a certain scale, it could be zero, but it could be it could be bigger than zero. And what what that means in in what we're about to do, the scale tells you something about how big neighborhoods are going to be. Right. And the other thing I want, which is actually very close to to the first, is graphs. Okay. So I'm, I'm looking for some place, and and I want functions between all of these. So I'm looking for some some category that has all of these things and functions between them in every which way. And it turns out that once you decide that that's what you want, you have lots of choices. <laughs> um, and so we're gonna we're gonna move bit by bit. Every choice has uh, something it's good at and something it's maybe not so good at. And uh, so we're gonna talk about three today. So one is going to be called check closure spaces. And these generalize topology in a very direct way. Another is semi-uniform spaces. And these generalize uniform spaces. If you don't know what that is, don't worry about it, but as we'll see, um, they're very useful when what's important in your analysis are relations between points and not necessarily uh, neighborhoods like, for instance, in the Vitor Strips complex. And then we're going to look at something that's a little bit of an odd man out, but I think very interesting, what we're going to call quasi-course spaces. Quasi-course spaces don't quite satisfy my characteristic, but instead of, in fact, they, they don't at all. You know, topological spaces are not not part of quasi-course spaces, but what is part of quasi-course spaces are the, the other extreme, which are, are course spaces. So we're gonna we're gonna see um, kind of a relationship in, in the other direction. So some, somehow, okay, let's let's start. I'm gonna spend most time. Um, all all the ideas are really very similar. In, in all three, so I'm going to spend the most time on check closure spaces, and then a little bit less on semi-uniform, and then much less in quasi-course. And then we'll come back and look at, um, actually, we're not even going to look at sheaves. Look at how to put a growth and dictopology topology on. Topology on the check closure spaces. Okay, let's let's begin. Um, a check closure operator or a closure space is a set with what's called a closure operator. So the closure operator is a map from the power set to the power set, which satisfies a couple of, of sort of common sense axioms. The <coughs> the map applied to the empty set is the empty set. Uh, it's expansive, right? So you you take a set and you apply the closure. The sets contained in the closure, and uh, it's it preserves finite unions, right? So the closure of the finite union is a finite union of the closures. Um, this is called a closure space, and we'll just call uh, C of A the the closure of A. Now, <clears throat> there's an extra sort of uh, property we get for free, which is that it's also monotone. Uh, you can you can play with which which uh, axioms give you that, but if A is less than B, then closure A is less than closure B. Uh, so this is, well, in what way 
right? Is this a definition, it's a generalization of top, topological spaces? Well, uh, the closure given by the topological closure, suppose we have a topological space, this is the normal closure everyone's familiar with, is a closure structure, but it has an extra property. And the extra property is that <coughs> the, the square is equal to itself. Okay? And, and actually, if you have any closure space such that the square of the closure is equal to itself, then uh, you can create a topology on the space in, in kind of the, the way you'd expect. Um, but we don't just have these. So we also have all of the, the examples I wanted to, to specify. Um, so that we have graphs. So let's take a graph. The closure of, of a point or of a vertex of the graph is just going to be the star. And then the closure of some subset is going to be uh, the union of all the, all the stars. And then we have, we have metric spaces. So it's a little bit more general. Um, <clears throat> where suppose we have a metric space and then our scale. Right? And the closure is set here, according to the scale, is going to be uh, all of the points within R of, of the, the, the original set. And all of these are closure operators. So what's interesting now is what happens with continuity. Uh, these are, you know, for better or worse, we still call functions continuous. Um, <clears throat> and a function is continuous if for every set, the function applied to the closure of the set is in the closure applied to the function of the set. Now let's look a little bit at what this means. So for topological spaces, this just gives you back the normal notion. Yes, is there a question? Sorry, okay. Um, <clears throat> for graphs, this also gives you back the normal notion actually. So what, what is a graph map is that you send edges to edges. So this is exactly what you expect to happen. Now, what's, what's more interesting is what happens with these metric spaces at a scale. And so I'm going to play with the, you know, <laughs> most well-known uh, definition of continuity you can imagine. So we, we're going to take two scales and two metric spaces, and I'm going to redefine continuity. So I'm going to say something QR continuous, if and if, only if. Then we have the epsilon delta mantra, you know, for every epsilon greater than zero, x and x, there's a delta, perhaps depending on x, it's that. The <coughs> if the distance between two points on the side is less than, now it's q plus delta, that implies that the distance on the other side in the image is r plus epsilon. So now let's look at what happens. Is there something here? Yes. Um, okay, yeah. Uh, so the first kind of proposition that is telling us that something is going on is that closure, the continuity in terms of closure structures and in terms of the closure structures that I defined with the, with the scale is exactly this notion, right? And so why, why is this good? Well, earlier I wanted a map like this. So what, what does this allow me to do? So let's take Q equals zero over here. Let's take R sort of big enough. No. Over here. Now I can I can have controlled, not arbitrary, but controlled discontinuities are now continuous in this QR sense, but also continuous in the closure sense. And so say I, I move, you know, this bit goes to that point, and the bit here, you know, goes to that point. Right? As long as I don't move too far away, these are still perfectly admissible maps in the category. Okay. Um, the other thing that's interesting about closure structures is uh, they have a very well-defined neighborhood uh, structure. Right? So <clears throat> you have a closure space. You take one set. It's a neighborhood of another set if it satisfies this kind of terrible-looking uh, relationship. But actually, this is exactly what you need. Um, so if you have, even in topological spaces, you know, you have a point, say, now I'm going to take a, you know, the neighborhood of a point. What, what is this? Well, I take out the neighborhood, boom, then I close what's left. You get this, you get all, all of this stuff. And then 
you take the complement of that, well, you get back exactly the, the neighborhood, the, the interior really of the neighborhood. Um, and that contains the point. And in particular, this, this expression on the right is called the interior view. Now, uh, I'll put this definition here. We're going to need it later, not, not immediately, but uh, we're going to say that a cover of X, there are di many different kinds of covers in closure spaces now, but it's an interior cover if the interiors of the sets in the cover now cover the, the whole set. Okay, and, and the um, really the critical thing about closure structures and closure spaces is neighborhoods of points, the neighborhood system of, of points, are enough to uniquely define the closure structure. And that's, a, that's an old theorem. Um, so if you have a set, <coughs> suppose we have for every x, we have a filter of subsets of x such that, well, it's not empty, um, x is in every, every set in the filter, and we have, well, this is, it's a filter, so it's um, kind of evident, but uh, actually, a priori, it's not a filter. So we just have a system of sets, but here's the, where we get a filter from. Uh, so if, if we have two sets, then there's a third set in the, the system, uh, which is contained in the intersection. And if we have these three characteristics, then there's exactly one closure structure on X, such that n of x now is, is generates the neighborhood filter. Sorry, so n here is not this. There's a the collection. Um, <clears throat> so this generates the neighborhood filter for every x, right? and you can you can also just give an expression for what the the closure is. It's kind of what you would expect from topological spaces. So it's all of the the points such that Every element, every neighborhood intersects the set. Right? Every neighborhood of that point intersects the set. So um, the words are familiar from topological spaces, but the, the actual kind of geometry uh, changes quite considerably. OK. Now, <clears throat> uh, I wanted to do algebraic topology, so I'm, I need to move toward uh, at least homology and, and ideally homotopy. And so we need products and various other sort of categorical uh, constructions. They're all, they all exist. Um, it would take a little time to go through each one, but you can kind of imagine uh, what you might have to do to the closure structure to, to define things correctly. <clears throat> and in particular, once you have in particular products, we can define homotopy just like normal, right? So you, you take two functions, uh, they're homotopic if and only if there's a if there's a homotopy, you know. Except that everything now is continuous in terms of closure structures instead of in in terms of topological spaces. And then you call spaces homotopy equivalent if you know the composition is uh, homotopic to identity on one side, and then the you know the reverse composition is homotopic to identity on the other. That's how we okay. So <clears throat> this first. Uh, first sort of theorem or remark really is that this is all good enough to define well and, and construct homotopy groups. Uh, so these homotopy classes uh, of based maps, you know, that we're pretty much familiar with from topological spaces are, have enough structure to get back homotopy groups and their billion uh, when you expect them to be. Uh, so this curiously, so I, I started working this you know, quite a while ago, and probably a year, a year and a half into it, uh, I found this old series of papers by uh, DeMaria and, and various collaborators where they were interested really in uh, directed graphs and applying these kinds of algebraic topological ideas to directed graphs. And they're all in conference papers. They're, it's very uh, sort of quick groups. Uh, or, I mean, in, in this this in particular, they just say, well, it all kind of works and um, it's fine. But anyway, there is some interesting early work in this in this direction um, by them. And then since th there were maybe six or seven papers and different things, mostly relating to shape theory, and then it kind of disappeared for a long time. So. Okay, <clears throat> so continuing on with, with homotopy, you can do a lot more, right? So... Th the thing that I studied in, in this first paper of mine, 
was uh, the fundamental group primarily. And what can we do with the fundamental group? Well, we have Van Kampen theorem, and this works as expected, uh, with the exception that the cover is a little bit unusual. Right? So the cover has to be an interior cover uh, and not an open cover. In fact, there are very few open, you can define open sets, uh, but there are very few open sets typically. And then uh, this goes through uh, an, an initial bit of um, covering space theory. So the technique covering spaces. And it's very interesting to see why it fails where it does. Uh, so the fundamental group of the circle for, and, and here this is a very specific circle, right? So this is a circle of circumference one. Um, <clears throat> so when R is sufficiently small, actually can be you know sort of medium sized, we get back the the normal fundamental group of the circle. When I was very big, uh, everything collapses, and the fundamental group becomes trivial. And in between is open. I don't know how to do this. So it would be very very interesting if someone wanted to figure this out, um, including say a student of mine. But you know, we'll see. Um, so so now, but how does this work, and why does it why does it work the way it does? Well, let's recall a little bit what has to happen. We have this cover, and for the, all of this to work, we need the P, right? We need there to be a neighborhood around every point such that this is homeomorphic, right? to z across the neighborhood. OK, <clears throat> so what happens as we, as the r gets bigger? Well, the, um, the subset, the neighborhood has to get bigger. So if you recall, the neighborhood is minus c of u. If I have a point here, Um, if C is now sort of expanding a lot, I have to take out a whole bunch of, of U has to be very big in order to, to make sure that the point is now in the set. Um, so as, as X gets bigger, or as U gets bigger, um, these neighborhoods get bigger, and the inverse image right, also gets bigger. So now maybe it's here. And something that is extraordinary is the following. So as a set, this stays true, kind of until R gets to, gets to 1 half. But it, it fails to be homeomorphic, right? Why? Because <clears throat> this is disconnected, and the moment R gets to 1 third, I can now take an arc. Let me take an arc, and just a, an interval, really. So, like zero one, and I'm allowed jumps that go up to one third. So what happens? So I, I go up to here. I, I pass by two thirds, right? Because that's my the size of my neighborhood, or a little bit more than two thirds, and then I can jump to the next bit, and then you can jump to the next one, and so this is now in t from the point of view of the closure space. This is now arcwise connected, whereas this space is not. Right? Even though as sets, there there's a bijection. Right? And so that's why this fails at one third. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so I mentioned before that what I was really going for was a way to uh, compare things functorially, and this is this is the unique uh, so far. Um, I, Hopefully we're close to some other examples, but this is one example where we can really do that. So now we have this, um, you know, ah, uh, what did I do here? Yes, okay, yes, this is fine. Um, so, so now we have, we know what this is, 
we have a pretty good guess now of what happens if we kind of coarsen the circle a little bit. So instead of a circle, I'm going to have endpoints. And I'm going to connect up, well, the, the CM indicates how far or how many points to each side are going to be in the closure of any given point. So if it's C2, it'll be like this, right? and so on, all the way around. <clears throat> okay, and now I have my circle. Uh, this is just a normal topological circle, and we're going to define it as a kind of nearest neighbor map. So every every point goes to the nearest one, and then on, on the on the boundary, you kind of pick one. You know, we're going to pick one consistently, although that doesn't really matter. Um, then the um, the result is that this map, when you when you apply the functor, actually does induce an isomorphism in uh, in, in the fundamental groups when the interval is, is the correct one. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so that's all I'm going to say for the moment about homotopy. Uh, well, no, I can say just a little bit more. Uh, we also have, uh, no, I already said this, actually. Yeah. So we have um, higher dimensional homotopy groups. The, the basic results kind of, you know, there's a long exact sequence and um, go through without, without much trouble. And we're going to push this forward uh, now as well. So <clears throat> I, I mentioned before that uh, closure spaces admit a very nice uh, notion of a neighborhood. And so what do, what do you want to do with a neighborhood? Well, two things, really. Uh, check homology or check homology and, and sheaf theory. Right? So, um, <clears throat> so I, I asked uh, one of my students, Luis Palacios, a few years ago, to look at check homology and cohomology. He did a really wonderful job uh, in his bachelor's thesis. And <clears throat> so the, the construction uh, and many of the proofs, although not, not quite all of them, go very much like the classical case. Uh, so we have uh, now we need interior covers and not covers. But let's say we have an interior cover. And we're going to look at the nerve of this interior cover. Right? It's the normal nerve. Now there, there's <clears throat> There are actually a couple of choices you can make about what kind of nerve you take, right? So you could you could take the nerve like just if you know the normal one, if, if two sets intersect at all. But you can also decide, well, you know, what I really want is I want one set to intersect the interior or something like this. Um, we haven't looked at that very much, but it's an option and it actually gives you kind of different um, not kind of, it gives you very different invariants. <laughs> okay. Um, but here we just do the the ordinary uh, construction with an, the ordinary nerve, and you define check cohomology. Uh, now taking the limit with respect to interior covers instead of open covers. Um, <clears throat> and we have a version of Allen-Riggs-Dienrod axioms. Uh, what's different? Uh, uh, what is different? Excision is a little bit different. Uh, is different. I'm not sure if that's. Um, if that's a hard constraint, if that's really, you know, the best there is, or or if we just didn't figure out how to. Uh, <clears throat> how to make it better, but what we need with excision, uh, you would like something like this, right? You would like that um, the closure of U is in the interior of A, then you can excise, you know, um, then you can excise U. Or, well, whichever direction. Um, And we have this if U is open. Now, like I said, there aren't necessarily that many open sets in closure spaces. So this is actually a very restrictive um, uh, condition. But if it's open, we, we do have this thing. Um, OK. And right. So we have also a, kind of the dual version, uh, check homology. 
except we take you know inverse limits instead of that of direct limits. And as in the original Czech homology for topological spaces, the axioms work as for Czech homology, that is with this, this caveat of uh, excision is different. And if the exactness axiom, like in the normal Czech homology, doesn't quite work. Uh, you get a long sequence. You, well, what happens, you get a long exact sequence for every cover. But then when you take the inverse limit, the exactness fails. Although you do still maintain a sequence, you get all of the homomorphisms, and the composition of any two gives you zero. But it's not exact anymore. Right? And that still happens here. Okay, so now, <laughs> now I want to switch to what are called semi-uniform spaces. And the reason I want to do this is to analyze what's called the Viator strips, homology and cohomology. Um, so the Viator strips homology is an extremely useful object computationally. It's used all the time in uh, applied topology, but it's also uh, a very theoretically mysterious uh, object. And <clears throat> there, there are some wonderful calculations by, uh, well, now I think a couple of groups. One, Henry Adams, this one, um, one common name, Henry Adams and Michel Adamashik, if I'm pronouncing this right, are two names in, in one of the groups, and Ziga Virk is a common name in the other. Um, my apologies to their various collaborators, but um, then they've, they have some wonderful calculations of what happens with different figures when you have the Viator search homology um, <clears throat> in, with different parameters. Uh, but, you know, except for that and a couple other papers, there, there's not a whole lot known uh, about, about this object. Now, semi-uniform spaces <clears throat> um, encode relations, and we're going to see this this here, and these relations can now be used to construct the Viator strips homology, and then because of, you know, sort of the nice way everything is, works, we can start to prove theorems like homotopy invariance and excision and so on for, for these for the Viator strips homology as well. Okay, so let's see what, what happens here. Um, <clears throat> I'd mentioned filters before. Here it's really a central uh, central object, so I'm going to um, define it you know, properly. So I'm going to, this sometimes is used, is a proper filter, um, but it filters a bunch of, of subsets. Oops. On the collection of subsets of X. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, I'm not going to let the empty set be in the filter. If any two sets, then the intersection is in the filter, in particular since the empty set's not there, then any two sets in the filter have a non-trivial intersection. And also a filter is closed under supersets. So if I have, I have a set, then every, every superset is in it. Okay, now semi-uniform structure is a filter not on the space, but it's a filter of relations. So it's a filter on X cross X. Um, so every every set in the filter now contains the diagonal. Uh, I want this to be somehow um, symmetric. So you, if if you is these are a bunch of pairs, right? So if this is in U, then yx is in U inverse. Um, <clears throat> And the semi-uniform space is, is nothing more than uh, a set and some filter on X cross X that has these two, these two properties. Um, I said before that this was a generalization of a uniform structure. Now, a uniform structure, if you, again, if you don't know what that is, we're not really going to use it. But if you do know what it is, let me just uh, show you how they're different. A uniform structure has this extra axiom that in addition to these two things, the filter has to satisfy the following, that for every element of the filter, there's another element such that the square is, is in the first one. So what's the square? So um, this is xz, such that there exists some y with in 
x versus x cross x with x, y in v and y, z in v. So somehow you're insisting that the, the filter, you know, gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Whereas here we don't have this, this, uh, this constraint. Okay, so, so there are a bunch of examples of these things. Uh, again, I'm going to go through kind of my list. I want uh, topological spaces. So the corresponding thing is a uniform uh, space. So we have uniform spaces. Um, <clears throat> and I want to look at what happens with a metric. So we're going to construct these things a little bit in a roundabout way. I'm going to take a semi-pseudometric, which is a non-negative function, which is symmetric and zero on the diagonal, but it could be zero in other places too. There's no uh, triangle inequality, which is very important. So, um, and then the collection of sets given by f of r, so that you know every pair which is less than r. According to this semi so this could be crazy, right? I mean, this, this is a very, very loose structure, very relaxed. Um, for every R, now generates my filter, which is the semi-uniform structure on, on X. Okay, what does this give you? Well, it gives you a way to uh, <coughs> look at metric spaces and a scale. So if I have a metric and a fixed scale, I can take both of these pieces of data, construct a semi pseudometric like this. So, so the semi pseudometric is now zero if the original metric is less than Q, and it starts to get you know bigger <coughs> when when it, you move move away from that. And now you construct the semi uniform space uh, as in the example here. And so what happens here? Let's look the diagonal and this band around the diagonal of size q and the filter uh, constructed here now looks at it takes all of the possible um, you know it can, it can be it can be strange as well uh, it takes all of the possible <laughs> sets that have to include this band of size q, right? So I don't. I have this minimal size that's positive, uh, and and that's actually what makes it a semi-uniform structure, not a uniform structure. So if if q is zero, then this this construction gives you back a uniform structure. Um, but if it's positive, then you get a semi-uniform structure that's not uniform. You can do the same thing with graphs. <laughs> so uh, it's it's much simpler in a way. If I have a graph then my relation is already embedded in the, or encoded in the, um, in the edges. And you just have to add the diagonal and you get some, some set that you want to insist is in every, every possible set of the filter. So you take that set as the generating set of the filter and you have a semi-uniform semi structure. You can also get, and this is, this is kind of fun, you can get a semi-uniform structure from closure spaces, right? So we, <laughs> If we have an interior cover there, uh, what's what's important for some uniform structures are relations. So now I'm going to relate any two points that are sitting inside the same set in the cover. And if I now iterate over all possible interior covers, I get a filter that I can use to generate the semi-uniform space. You can also do something a little different. You can define another relation where you insist that one or the other of the points is in the uh, is in the interior of the side of the cover, right? They could both be in the interior, but at least one has to be in the interior. This also generates a perfectly good filter, and it constructs a semi-uniform space. Okay, so what are we going to do with these? Uh, why do I have this? Ah, right. So I, I just went from closure spaces to semi-uniform spaces. Uh, actually, that's the more the more traditional thing to do is to go from semi-uniform spaces to closure spaces. Um, 
And there's a there's a canonical way to do that. So now, suppose I have a semi-uniform, well, so what I'm going to say, I'm just going to define this thing. So I have some set here in x cross x. I'm going to find u of x to be all of the points in y so that, that are related to x. Um, here, I can now construct, so I said before that uh, a closure space was uniquely determined by this, this system of sets at every point. So here, we have a system of sets at every point that um, satisfies the, the axioms that I, that I stated earlier, and it determines a closure, closure space to, that from the semi-uniform structure. And we just say that, um, on the other hand, if you have a semi, if you have a closure space, and there exists some semi-uniform structure that that uh, induces it in this way, then the closure space is semi-uniformizable. Um, and there's this, this curious uh, result. Again, it's, it's a classical result, but it says that a closure space is semi-uniformizable if it has a certain symmetry property. So, if whenever a point is in the closure of another point, that implies that the reverse is true as well, that the, the second point is in the closure of the first. And we're not really going to use this much, but I thought it's a, a nice result. Um, okay, and this is kind of, uh, again, to differentiate what's going on with, with uniform spaces. So if I have a uniform space and I do this, this procedure, I get a topological space. Not only do I get a topological space, I get a regular topological space. Um, so it's it's a quite strong uh, condition, this, this uniformity. Okay. Now, we've said what a uniform uh, space is. Let's look at continuity. Uh, it's really kind of what you would, you would expect if you think about what uniform continuity is and try to get rid of uh, the metric, um, or, you know, what the epsilon delta version of uniform continuity is. So a function from, between semi-uniform spaces is uniformly continuous if and only if for every uh, element in the filter of the range, there's an element of the filter of the domain such that uh, f sends the u into, into v. And we also have this same, um, I changed the called it PQ and not QR, but um, <clears throat> we have the same situation uh, as we did before in closure spaces. So uh, if I have metric spaces and I pick a scale for each metric, now these are PQ continuous if and only if uh, I have uniform continuity as well. And then, you know, also for the induced uh, closure spaces. But, all right. So now how do we get a Vitor Schipps homology out of this? So we have these relations, right? Uh, here's my semi-uniform space. I'm going to fix an element in the filter. And with that element, well, that, that basically gives me a graph, right? I just, I just rename, really, the, the element u. I'm going to call it e now. Um, so that gives me points and vertices and edges. And now you take the click complex of this graph, right? It could be an infinite graph, it could be even uncountable, um, but but you know the click complex is only looks at finite subsets, so you're you're fine. Uh, and this gives you a simplicial complex, maybe a very large, complicated simplicial complex, but it's simplicial complex. It, you might the graph is a priori directed, but there's a perfectly good notion of a directed click complex. So if you you have to, you you use that. Although that's not so important, again, because the we're, we're going to do this, then we're, we're going to take limits. Um, and actually, the uh, symmetric elements in the, in the filter are cofinal. So when you take limits, you only have to look at the symmetric things. But you know, uh, we can look at the directed click complex if we want. So here's a simplicial complex related to an element of of the filter, well, any relation really, but an element of the filter. Now, um, I want a homo homology theory, so I need uh, also the relative, um, you know, a subcomplex. 
given by a subset. So now here, I again take my element of the filter, I take a subset, and you just intersect the element of the filter with A cross A. Um, and I have this perfectly good uh, filter here. We call this the relativization of F by A, and this ends up being also a semi-uniform space, a semi-uniform structure on A. Um, more than that, the corresponding subcomplex, or the corresponding simplicial complex, just looking at U of A, is a subcomplex of the original. All right, so, so now we have, for every element of the filter, we have a relative simplicial homology and a relative simplicial, or a, you know, simplicial homology of pairs and a simplicial cohomology of pairs. Um, now, <clears throat> so that's looking at one element of the filter, and now I want to take limits to kind of eliminate the filter from, well, not eliminate, but um, to remove the dependence of that particular element of the filter. And so now I get the terserp homology and cohomology. Like in check homology and cohomology, the cohomology is the direct limit and homology is the inverse limit. Okay, I have to go a little bit faster. But Okay, so now I have these homologies. Um, actually, I have very nice uh, properties. All of the Eiling Bridgestein rod axioms work this time. Uh, although you have to change the statements a little bit, so uh, but but they're less restrictive than than we found in the the check case. Um, so how does homotopy work? Again, products of semi-uniform spaces uh, have a natural semi-uniform structure, so we can define homotopy. And also, the interval has a natural semi-uniform structure, which is just the one given by the well, the uniform sp structure. Um, and so homotopy is exactly what you'd expect. Homotopy equivalence is exactly what you'd expect. And then we have this um, <coughs> this theorem that says, well, if two maps are homotopic, then the induced maps on the Viator strips homology and cohomology are equal. Okay, so that's what homology looks like. Um, excision is a little bit unusual, but then what, what, the moment you, you think about what it has to be and what kind of kinds of things we have, this is the natural statement. So um, I have a semi-uniform space. I have my sort of chain of, of subsets. <clears throat> and I'm going to insist that there's some kind of bound, say, in, in the filter, such that for every, um, what is, what am I doing here? Right. <clears throat> for any subset of this, the special set, I have the following property. So U of B is an A. So what is U of B? So again, this is this set. It's all of the X in X here, such that Y X is in U and Y is in A. Right, so there are all the points in X that are related to some point in A. Okay, so given that, um, <clears throat> the excision proof actually goes through very nicely. You have to, there are a few tricks, but it's it's not complicated. Um, and you, you get a very nice excision result. B, right? Pardon? It's U of B, a point in B. U of, uh, yes, sorry, yes. Yes. Perfect, thanks. Okay. And, right. So, so <clears throat> actually, I, I might skip these. I, I thought I would anticipate a few a few questions that I often get. Um, may, maybe I will actually. There it is. So so often I get the following two questions. So one is why don't I look at uh, finite topological spaces instead of you know all of these kind of very non-standard um, structures? And and the the answer is just that 
if I really want to look at a metric and a scale, um, yes, there are lots of finite topologies lying around, but there there aren't any that I know of anyway, uh, which interact well with with the metric and the scale simultaneously. Um, if you know how to do that, write a paper and send it to me. I'd be very interested in seeing how that works, but I don't know how to do it. So I do know how to do this other stuff. Uh, a little more subtle is is this. So metric spaces and one Lipschitz maps do give some kind of functoriality, uh, but it's a little bit limited. I mean, so uh, there are lots of interesting maps which are covered or, or are included in these <coughs> these categories, which are not included in, in which are just aren't one Lipschitz. It, focusing on one Lipschitz maps makes it harder to compare structures at different scales. Like I said before, I want these sort of controlled discontinuities, uh, which which are not available there. And so one Lipschitz, it's it's not terrible, uh, but it doesn't do everything that I want to do with these uh, uh, with these constructions. Right? Also, if you um, if you look at metric spaces, you can of course take products and quotients and so on. Uh, but if you look at metric spaces and also look at the scales, and then try to combine them all into a product or a quotient or even a, a disjoint union, um, <clears throat> you you have to do strange things with the scale in order to get everything to work out kind of uh, in a sensible way, and it's it's just inconvenient. Um, okay, maybe not impossible, but it's inconvenient. And another question, I think this. Well, yeah, I'll say two words about this. So I'm, I'm far from the first to think about, uh, you know, ways to to make homotopy theory work for uh, very discrete objects or combinatorial objects. So <laughs> digital homotopy goes all the way back to the late 80s, I think. Um, and then th this looks at, you know, kind of what you think. You have a, a grid and your sub your your spaces are you know subsets of this grid um, you know do homotopy theory on this uh, the work of Barcelo et al you look at um, typically graphs but it's also sometimes some social complexes uh, and try to again imitate the um, <coughs> instructions of algebraic topology uh, there's also I didn't mention I didn't write it down here there's a group um, And Alexander Grigoryan is is among them, but there's another Morazov, I think. Um, that's probably wrong. Uh, that's looking at algebraic topology and homotopy theory on uh, directed graphs and how to do that. And then here, uh, Conrad Plout and his collaborators are <laughs> looking at metric spaces, uh, but kind of looking again at these controlled, I mean, he defines it in a different way, but it's, it's essentially the same thing, at these controlled discontinuities and seeing what you can say uh, as, um, what you can say about a metric space, but even the geometry of a metric space, as the, um, that's not quite true, what you can say about, you know, things like the geometry of generators of the fundamental group and so on, as the, uh, <coughs> the discontinuity gets bigger. Um, Okay, uh, so interestingly, you know, graphs fit in closure spaces, and uh, Bubinik Milicevic looked very closely at exactly how all of these these other different theories, you know, sort of emerge. But what they found was that yes, you can um, express the, these different <laughs> discrete homotopy theories in terms of closure spaces. Uh, and, and there's some interesting relationships between them. They're not at all the same as, as what I've presented here. So you have you have to choose instead of instead of the interval, you have, sometimes have to choose just two points or a graph on two points. Uh, sometimes the the product is and is not the Cartesian product. But anyway, you can play with things and recover um, the different models that, that people have studied. Um, so it's kind of interesting. Now, whether, um, <clears throat> yes, okay. Now, a quasi-core space, I only have a few minutes. Uh, I'll do this this bit a little bit quickly, and then the, the growth and topology very quickly. So a quasi-core space, 
uh, came out of, I should say this is the master's thesis of Jonathan Trevino. He wrote with me. Um, so this came out of kind of a naive question, and it's a question that, uh, so if you work in applied topology and you talk to other geometer friends, maybe not in the, um, in the field, uh, you talk about, well, you know, I have these finite point sets and, and I, I want to do algebraic topology on them or something. Uh, <clears throat> every now and then you'll find somebody who, who refer, refer you to, to course geometry because it, it looks very much the same, uh, except that everything is infinite. So, for instance, in course geometry, the real line is equivalent to the integers. Unfortunately, in course geometry, um, any compact set is equivalent to a point, right? So that makes us inappropriate to bring in unmodified anyway into applied topology where everything we do really is compact just because we're working with finite computers. Um, <clears throat> but I, I asked Jonathan, if we look at exactly where, what, what is it about course geometry that destroys these compact sets? And <clears throat> It's exactly, so course geometry like is, is a little bit somehow dual to the some uniform structure. So we have, again, some, some sets, a collection of sets on x cross x. Uh, it's not a filter anymore, so we, we don't have closure under supersets, but you do have closure under subsets. Uh, again, you have, um, you have the symmetry. And instead of closure under finite intersections, we have closure under finite unions. So it's it's really a kind of dual structure. That's the the quasi uniform structure. I mean the quasi coarse structure. Sorry. <laughs> now if we add to this uh, the property that for any two sets there their product is is in the set or is in the collection, then you end up killing all of all of the uh, all of the compact sets. But if you throw this axiom away, uh, you don't, right? You actually get compact sets, which are, uh, from the point of view of the structure, non-trivial. And <clears throat> so we do something very, very much in parallel to what we did in the um, semi-uniform case. Uh, continuity, or we call it Bernoulli's functions. This time it, it works very much the same. Um, and there's some examples, so graphs give good examples. There's a canonical structure on Z, which is a nice example. So you just uh, <coughs> here, here are your relations, and then you take all the possible subsets of those, those and finite unions of those relations. Um, <coughs> now what's curious about this structure is that there's no canonical structure on the interval, say, or a compact Hausdorff space. Uh, so the homotopy, if you want to define homotopy, um, has to be done with some other set. Uh, so we, we chose Z. And this actually, you should say that this idea here is exactly what Barcelo did in, in their work. Um, their definition of, of discrete homotopies for, for graphs uh, basically exactly this. So we, we borrowed this and used it here. And this gives you, so so the bad part about getting rid of this, this axiom is you also destroy the notion of course equivalence, which is what course geometry is based on. The good part about recovering some kind of homotopy is that you can, you can put back a notion of, or you can replace course equivalence with homotopy equivalence. Um, and th this actually seems to work uh, surprisingly well, at least conceptually. Um, okay, <clears throat> and so what, what Jonathan proved in his thesis were two things. So first, uh, we have homotopy groups, and they're, they act like they, they expect. And second, he, um, he computed the fundamental group for this, this one example. So uh, working with these, these structures is much more difficult and less, less intuitive than um, than working with, say, some uniform structures or, or uh, closure spaces, so the <clears throat> the results, you know, are a bit more restricted. But um, but it's a very nice, very nice bit of work. 
And there was one other thing. Right. So <clears throat> there's also a way, a kind of kind of dual way, to get a Viator Swift homology for quasi coarse spaces. Uh, we do essentially the same thing. So we have you know a bunch of a bunch of sets in X cross X. Uh, for every set, you have a substantial complex, and then these sets sort of uh, grow. You know, they're, they're they're arranged so that they you have a directed system or an inverse system, whichever you need. Um, you take limits, you get a perfectly good homology or cohomology theory. This time, because of the way things are structured, the homology is the direct limit and the cohomology is the in inverse limit. Um, and that changes, you know, a few things, but uh, <clears throat> but it works very nicely. And the other thing that was proven in his thesis was that you have homotopy invariants. Right. Okay, I have negative two minutes. Um, this unfortunately is complicated. Um, let me just say that, uh, <clears throat> again, coming back to closure spaces, uh, so I mentioned before, closure spaces are given by, by neighborhoods. And when you have, you know, covers and neighborhoods, you, you think immediately about doing two things. One is check homology and cohomology, and the related construction is sheaf cohomology. Um, <clears throat> so check cohomology was fairly easy to define. Sheaf cohomology actually required one additional idea. Uh, it was very hard to see, but then once once you see it, it, it goes through very nicely. Uh, so the this is not the additional idea. So we're going to, the idea, that I'm going to appeal to without explaining <laughs> without explaining it at all. I want to construct a growth and topology on on uh, closure spaces or on a closure space, but I don't have open sets. And the first approximation of open sets are neighborhoods. Now the problem with neighborhoods is that when you intersect them, the intersection may not be in a neighborhood of anything. Okay, so <clears throat> and then the other problem is is the following if you you take Grothendieck's construction and you try to apply it to closure spaces there's a certain ambiguity as to whether or not you want covers of subsets seen as subsets with the the original uh, interior operator or if you want them seen as subspaces with a different interior operator and the kind of traditional thing would be to look at them as subspaces, but it turns out the correct thing is to look at them as subsets. And so I'm going to just skip all this. Um, the important idea is not that, it's this. Okay, so <clears throat> again, I have, instead of a closure operator, I have this interior operator, which I mentioned before. Um, and if for any subset, we say that this, some collection is an eye cover, if first it's a cover, and second, if the interiors of of my cover cover the interior of the set, right? And and this is instead of to remember a, an interior cover, I would want this, right? But here I just want the the interior. <clears throat> okay, and it turns out that this these eye covers uh, form a perfectly good basis of the growth and topology uh, on a closure space. And with that, you can you can do sheaf theory. So this is what um, what I said here. All right. I think that was. And here are the a bunch of references. Um, this is the old paper. This is Peter Lubinik Milicevic's work. This is the, the book that has um, everything you ever wanted to know about uh, points at topology and. And is Luis's thesis and the papers that I'm referring to, a book on course geometry, and finally uh, Jonathan's thesis. So uh, thanks to my, my sponsors and funders, and thanks to everyone in the audience. Any thanks, Antonio, for this uh, nice talk? Oh, let me start. In the name of all the audience. So, do we have any questions for Antonio? Just unmute yourself and ask him for.
question. Uh, yes, I, I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, in, in these generalized notions of topology, do you have useful concepts of connectedness? Yeah. And the reason, the reason sure. I well, the reason I ask, uh, Tony, mm -hmm. is because when you when you define a homotopy, you you use the unit interval, which is like a standard connected space, mm -hmm. and then in one example you used uh, the integers, and so would the integers in that particular context be like would that be a connected space, a, sort of a standard connected space? So um, in the integers, let's see, where did I go? In the quasi-core spaces, I use the integers, right, for a homotopy. Yeah, 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 yeah. So there, there we haven't thought much about connectedness. I, I would expect if if things work the way they should, the integers there should be connected, or you should be able to see them. And, and it's the standard definition yeah. of connectedness. What's that? It's the standard definition of connectedness. No, no, no it's so a different definition. Is, well, yeah. so right now. I'm not even sure we. I mean, I'm not. Even, I'm not sure we've even we've even thought through the definition of of connectedness there. Um, the the issue with quasi core spaces are tricky because you don't have even um, really good notions of of covers, right? So, like for connectedness, you'd really like to be able to say, well, you know, you can partition or not your set, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and this is this is a problem with quasi core spaces. Now, in the other in the other ones, you have it. It's it's great. It, it works very nicely. Um, but here, it's it's tricky, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very nice talk. Very nice. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. You have any more questions? Okay, so hey, we hi, uh, ah, I got we a have question. A, please go on. Uh, um, hi, Tony. Um, hi. Uh, well, my question is: Is it possible to have, uh, in the case of um, check uh, check spaces like closure spaces, and mm -hmm. in, in, the, in that case, you were able to define uh, the fundamental group of uh, of the mm -hmm. uh, for closure space, and right. uh, well, I'm not. I, I I don't know if I get it, but were you able to define the the homotopy homotopy groups of uh, closure space in general, like for yeah, yeah, yeah. any? Sure. Uh, well, the higher is, is, groups are there. Uh, higher. Okay. So, is it is it possible to have a Hurewicz theorem ver uh, version uh, of the Hurewicz so, theorem? So that's a good question. Uh... So for Czech homology, I don't know. I think they, I think Peter and Nicola might have done something like this for uh, for singular homology cohomology, um, but I don't remember okay. right now. So we oh. we definitely haven't. Uh, it's it's a natural question, and it you know you expect something to work, but I don't know exactly what. Yeah. You know. Okay. Yep. Thank you very much. Oh, thanks. Okay, anything else? Not now. You'll certainly get more questions later.